I work in the area of artificial intelligence, and very recently somebody said to me, um, or said to a group of people they were he was talking to, you know, artifi artificial intelligence is the field which concerns itself with very, 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 very hard problems. And I thought to myself, well, how smarmy that is, you know? <laughs> I mean, how unctuous, how unfair that remark is, because every one of you works in a field that has very, very, very hard problems to solve, whether it's physics or chemistry, anthropology, political science. No matter what it is, they're very, very hard problems to solve. So it certainly isn't unique to artificial intelligence. That person did not understand what artificial intelligence is about. Artificial intelligence is about building machines or engines that are general purpose problem solvers with more or less large domains of application. They can be applied to medical imaging, they can be applied to art, they can be applied to weapon systems, they can be applied to theater, they can be applied to games and entertainment and iPhones and da 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 everything. And of course, if you take artificially away from it, then they have a very large application domain and they are called human beings. And we are probably the most widely spread application device on this planet at the moment, okay? We, our genus is called Homo. Our species is called Sapiens, and that's the way you think about it as Homo sapiens. But that's not complete. We really are the subspecies Homo sapiens sapiens, the wise, wise, politically correct person, <laughs> man, okay? Uh, so we can't really call what we're going to develop in artificial intelligence um, that, because that's the, uh, that's the natural name. My objective in artificial intelligence for my entire 40-year career has been to build a completely robust personal artificial intelligence whose cognitive capabilities are on a par with us, intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, in every way. But we need another name for it. We also need to stop calling it a personal artificial intelligence with cognitive capabilities on a par with human beings, or like Paul, I'm going to have to end up with inventing an acronym for it, you know? So uh, instead, um, what I'm going to do is suggest that we rename things for the artificial one as artifactum. How's your Latin? Sapiens, because it's a wise artifact. And, oh, Mada. What is Mada? Mada is Adam spelled backwards. <laughs> Sorry about the sexist stuff here, but Eve is a palindrome. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is it ends in an A, which means that in most of the Romance languages, we think of it as being not an it, but a she. And over the years, we've stopped saying it. We now say she. So Mata is a she. Mata is the name of that being that does not exist yet, that is on a same par with us. Good morning, Mata. Hi, Peter, that we haven't developed yet, but we're well on our way to, and I would like to tell you the story of that trip. We begin with a graph, we scientists love graphs. And on this graph, I'm going to show you how much memory we know is devoted to the adult human brain. It's called 100 terabytes, but if you like other numbers, it's 10 to the 15th bits, and if you still don't know what I'm talking about, just figure a one with 15 zeros after, okay? And that's what you've got as the capacity of your, mine, everybody's brain, well, most of you anyway, in this, in this room, okay? And in 1976, when I put this chart together, I looked back at the, at the memory capacities that had existed so far in computers, and I regressed that line to show how it had grown so far. And then I took the bull by the horns and I said, okay, we're gonna project into the future, and Here's what happened over the years with my personal computers. That's an actual plot. Now, 
you say, my God, it obeys a straight line. Be, 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 be careful, this is logarithmic. Every unit here is a factor of 10. Every unit here is a increment of six. So this is a linear axis, and this is a logarithmic axis. In a linear vertical axis, it would look like an exponential curve, okay? So that's pretty good, huh? Because if you draw that line through it, you notice that they fit pretty well. So I'm, I'm pretty proud. Never mind. Anyway, um, I actually got and extended that line. And you can see the last computer, which the Department of Defense bought for me just a little while ago there, next to now, right? And it all fits really pretty well so that I can place some dependency on doing some extrapolation into the future. Now, you might say, well, OK, uh, Peter, we're, we're, we're not up to the adult human brain. Where are we? Yeah, we, we're, we're at the shrew right now. The shrew is the smallest mammal on the surface of this planet. It has an IQ of 0.1. <laughs> but we're going to come back to this, because in the meantime, we've had to work with this limited resource. I've always known that we were going to be resource limited. I've always known that, because 100 terabytes devoted to a single core processor, if we were to put that all together in a small enough area so that we could run it, it would be liquid and hot and not work, OK? We can't do that yet, but we will, perhaps. So in the meantime, about 1990, I got a project started and funded called the ELISA project. And ELISA was Mata's great-grandmother is Mata's great-grandmother. And ELISA is not the largest possible problem of domain for solving, and not the deepest in terms of sophistication, but a big step. And so we've used ELISA, which stands for Adaptive Learning Image and Signal Analysis. And all of your friends who are named ELISA, it means the same thing there, too. <laughs> Adaptive learning, image, and signal analysis. We have used that machine in biomedical applications, in weapons and defense security applications, and in anthropological applications, and in pharmaceutical applications, and in microscopy applications. Throughout every field you can possibly imagine that has enough money to pay us for it, we've used it. The question now is, which you're dying to see, is when does this line you know which line I'm talking about? When does this line meet this line? Because that's when we're going to be there, right? So let's go there. See, it's not 100 years from now. Seemed like an impossible task back in 1976, but we only have to wait until 2036. In fact, we don't have to wait that long. We don't have to wait that long because that's when Mata will be an adult. You weren't born an adult. Mata won't be born an adult. You were born knowing almost nothing with a very low capacity. The capacity wired itself up as fast as you could learn. For most of you sitting here under 25, that is still happening. For the rest of us, it's kind of the other way around. <laughs> But it doesn't matter because it's still a huge amount of memory. And in fact, if this is an IQ of 100 up here, then you can see that if we're down here, we're sitting four orders of magnitude down at 0 0.01 IQ. That shrew, nonetheless, has an enormous capability for solving problems. But they aren't your problems. They're the shrew's problems, which are really different. But it knows how to defend itself and feed itself and reproduce and meet with other shrews and play bridge. <laughs> you didn't know that. Oh, yeah, they're good bridge legs, yeah. Um, so those, this is when we can expect it to be an adult. But what we're really interested in is when will Mata be born? When can we turn her on? And then as technology keeps up with it, continue to add memory onto it, and keep teaching her and having her learn through experience. And that will happen 
in about 2024. That's 12 years away. And we are right on schedule, both software and hardware. Right on schedule. We have a few more problems to solve in terms of the learning mechanisms, but we know how to do it. That brings up the question, should we? That's a different talk. I would love to talk about that, and I will gladly with you if you'll buy me a Coke. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it's going to happen whether I do it or whether somebody else does it. It's going to happen, and it's going to have enormous social ramifications. This is the point we're looking at. This is when Mata comes out of gestation, is turned on, and if you've ever seen a, an infant that's just born, knows nothing but is learning instantly at a rate you cannot possibly believe. And I think Paul Schutte would agree with me that we have to be especially careful during those first few weeks and months not to screw that up, because that's when a lot of harm can get done. Eh? Okay, let's go back to the present. Let's go back to Eliza. And let's try to do something with Eliza that we've never tried to do before. Adaptive learning image and signal, last word, analysis. Analysis means, in, from the Greek, to take apart. Okay? But it has occurred to me a few years ago that we might use her learned abilities to take things apart, once she gets them apart, to put something based on that information new together, to synthesize, to create, to build something new. That's not exactly solving a problem, but it certainly is part of creativity, which is a necessary component of all problem solving. We've heard that before this evening also. So if we go back and we look at what we can do with Eliza, I had to ask myself the question a few years ago, well, what can Eliza create from her visual knowledge that she's learned? And what visual knowledge should we give her? I don't want to build a lot of articulators on the output to learn how to grab things and move things, because that takes my time to do the mechanical engineering, and I don't want to do that. Okay? We are in computer science, have a wonderful articulator we use all the time. It's called consciousness. No, it's called a computer display. It's called a display on which we put colored pixels wherever we want, and we make things that look like something or not on that screen, and we have created something. Suppose I turn that job over to Elisa, but not until I finished bringing her up, training her. That is to say, why don't we see if we can't get Elisa, as you might expect an idiot savant to do, she can't go to the movies, to paint. Well, what does that mean? You train Elisa with a sample, a large sample, of the works of a master. Van Gogh, Matisse, Renoir. Pick the Impressionists because I'm particularly impressed by the Impressionists. <laughs> then we show Elisa a photo of anything we want, a, a scene in the kitchen, a scene of a person, a picture of a sailboat, a picture of the ocean mountain, whatever. And we say, Eliza, would you please represent that subject in the following ways? Would you either emphasize or not the realism? Would you either please make it very influenced by the particular artist or not so much? 
And would you please make things very precise or not so precise in terms of physical size? Those are the three parameters we picked. We could have picked more. I didn't want to pick more. I just wanted to try something. And then we tell, OK, Elisa, we've trained you. OK, you've seen 168 Van Gogh paintings. Paint us something. This was a project which we began several years ago, myself and one of my graduate students in an independent research project. His name is Ben Rubinger. He's one of those really, really bright graduate students that you love to work with. And he did all of the coding and built all of the software and the graphical user interface and so forth for the Elisa engine. And I watched him. <laughs> Here's an original photograph. Imagine how Renoir would represent that. That's how Lisa represents it. I asked her to keep the realism to medium, the influence of Renoir to high, and the precision to medium. That means you can put in small little things and big little things, but about equal measure of both. This is a photograph of an old man. I said, OK, Elisa, let's use Van Gogh. We train her in Van Gogh, and we let her, no pun intended, go. Now, there's not too much difference in here, but this is with a very high realism, very high influence by Van Gogh, and a medium precision. That one hangs in my office. That one hangs in her living room. I have to say something here. I'm going to let Van Gogh go on this one, but I'm going to say to Van, to Eliza, don't worry about the influence of Van Gogh. I mean, worry about the influence of Van Gogh, OK? But let realism go. I don't care if it's not realistic at all, which I think probably would please Van Gogh, since he didn't do very highly realistic paintings. Now look carefully at this and see if you can figure out with a lack of complete lack of realism, how Elisa went from this to this. I call this oil spill. <laughs> when we looked at that, we were simply astonished. What you're seeing is a very, very truncated sample of the pixels that Elisa is painting because she is painting about 4 million pixels. And if I were to take them at this speed, we would be here, as Paul was worried, until weeks in the future. So you're seeing big blocks of things happen at the same time. But you notice that it doesn't quite clear why she goes where she goes to paint when she paints and what she does. She's just doing it the way she wants. And that's what she ended up with. That process takes hours to do at current speeds, mainly because of the I.O. binding that is required here. If she didn't have to put that up on the screen, it would happen much faster. I'm really pleased about what we have been able to do with Elisa here, because it's very important, even though it's a very narrow and not wide problem definition. Aliza cannot go to the grocery store. She can't comb her hair. She can't comb my hair. She can't give me a massage. She can't do anything. That's all she can do. It's called a vertical application, and it's of very little use to anybody. But I love it. Thanks very much.